Some time ago, I released a comprehensive review of my Brennerly Hobo stove. Well, since that time, based on questions that were given to me in the comments section under the video, I have uh, an update video I'd like to share with you. If you're interested, keep watching. Okay, as uh, usual, I do have to declare that this stove was given to me by Tobias at Brennerly Stoves, and I did not pay for it, but I've had this for some time, and I've already done the comprehensive review, so what I wanted to do now is I give you a little bit of an update on the stove since I did that review, and answer some of the questions that were posted to me, and, and today I chose to do it because I thought I'd bring it out and use it to make my lunch with. And the reason I brought this out is I thought it'd be a good day to demonstrate how it can be used with charcoal. Uh, we're still under a fire ban. I can't build any fires in it today, but I can use charcoal to cook my lunch with. So that was one of the questions is, how well will it work with charcoal? Well, I'll demonstrate that in a few minutes time. So what were some of the other questions with it? Well, one of them related to wood pellets. And I wanna show you the inside of the stove. Take the crossbars off and then give you my thoughts on using wood pellets inside of uh, the Brennerly. So if I bring it up close, hopefully you'll be able to see inside and see that the fire grate, which is quite deep, there's the level of the fire grate way down here at the bottom of the stove. The holes inside might hold pellets. Now, I pour if you pour them in like a big bunch of pellets all at the same time, they will bunch up and hold themselves in place. They won't uh, fall through the holes. But if you slowly pour them in, more of your pellets are gonna go through those holes and then get caught. So it, the holes are just a slight bit too big, really, for using this stove with wood pellets. But that's not the reason I don't use this stove with wood pellets, or I don't think it's a good stove for using with wood pellets. The reason I think it's not a good candidate for using with wood pellets is the depth of the fire plate. Most stoves don't do well with wood pellets if the capacity is more than one cup. Maybe two cups of pellets, but one cup is what I like to use in most of my stoves that I use with wood pellets, that is. And uh, that's a long ways down. The pellets are way down here. It will work. You will get heat up to the top, but not near as much heat delivered to the bottom of your pot or your pan or whatever you're using as it would as if the fire grate were at least halfway up the stove, much closer to the bottom of your pot. So that's my reason for not using wood pellets in the Brennerly Hobo stove as is. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think it could be easily modified and then you could adapt it for use with wood pellets. And there's a couple of ways you could do that. Um, one of the plates that comes with the Brennerly is this one and it is used for solid fuel. That's primarily what this was intended for, was for solid fuel. And if I drop this plate down inside, I'll show you how that goes in, or I'll show you it inside the stove. There are notches on each side and then little rivet studs around the outside that keep it from going down past a certain point. So now you can see that plate sitting at about just over one inch, maybe one and a quarter inches below the surface of the top of the stove. Uh, you could pile some wood pellets on top of that and use it from there, especially if you put your crossbars on. The crossbars would probably provide you enough height. But I think a much better solution is if I could have something very similar to this plate, a little smaller in diameter so that it would pass by those little rivet studs and then drop down to a level about these holes or maybe even these holes. And there's quite a few series of holes on this uh, stove. Tobias designed that in for airflow, uh, except for these two. They, they go with the gas attachments as I showed in the other video. But if I could have a plate similar to this with smaller holes in it that would be more assured of keeping the pellets from dropping through, I could then run a couple of tent stakes, skewers, titanium tent stakes, whatever, through the holes at the level that I wanted to, maybe down at about that far, then pour in my one cup of pellets and light it, I'm pretty sure, and I might experiment with it yet, I'm pretty sure you would have sufficient airflow and the proper distance away from the top of the stove, especially if you use the crossbars, to have a good performance with wood pellets. You just don't want to put so many wood pellets in the stove that they start coming out of these holes. And again, if you stay with one cup, that's not likely to be an issue. Okay, so that's using with charcoal. Well, I have yet to demonstrate that, but I will. And using it with wood pellets. Now, the other comments that came in were, how about using it with a traditional Swedish fire torch? 
Okay, uh, before I answer that question, I, I will answer that I have used this stove with both a bottom-up burn and a top-down burn. And by that I mean start the fire in the bottom, add your sticks in as you go, add more fuel in through the top because this, of course, the height of those crossbars uh, makes it very easy to add sticks in as you go. That's my preferred way of using this stove. Now, I could and have just loaded a whole bunch of sticks in, vertically, horizontally, or haphazardly for that matter, light a fire on top and let the fire work its way down through the fuel load. That also will work and is not a bad option. Uh, there's pros and cons to both and then I'll talk about the Swedish fire torch. So the pro to a bottom-up burn where you add wood as you need it is that you get to control the amount of heat that you're generating. If you're looking for a fast boil of a pot of water then you know you can get the maximum heat out by adding a lot of wood and get a good roaring fire in it. But if you're looking to control the heat for frost with a fry pan or coals for even grilling on, you're going to want to have a reduced fire. Uh, by the way, this is not the best stove for grilling over with wood because it doesn't retain embers very well. Uh, not bad, but not as well as some other stoves that, that open fire grate and the amount of airflow causes most of the wood just to be reduced to ash, in, from flame to ash, rather than going to the embers and coals. Uh, so you will get some, so it will work, so I'm not saying it doesn't work, it's just not as good as some other stoves. Okay, so if I load it from the bottom, uh, light it at the bottom and add fuel as I go, I get more control over it. The downside, of course, is I'm constantly feeding wood. So if you don't mind feeding wood to control the amount of heat, then you're going to, that's the way to use it. If you're just looking for a sustained high amount of heat for a period of time to boil a big pot of water, then that's when a top load works the best, I find. Uh, especially if you do vertically stacking of wood, the fire will migrate into that vertically stacked wood and you'll get a lot of heat it would be a consistent lot of heat for the period of time that the fuel uh, remains until it's burnt through. Uh, the downside is you don't get to control it. You are subject to the heat that it, it creates. You can't control, you know, vary the amount of heat that you're going to get, at least until after the wood is burnt down. Then, of course, you can go back to feeding sticks in as you, as you need or want. Okay, let's talk about a Swedish fire torch for a second. So, when I think of a Swedish fire torch, I think of a log of a given size, and if you're going to use it with a wood stove, then something that's just slightly smaller in diameter than the stove itself is. I'll take that log, cut it to the height so that it's below the surface or below the rim of the stove. I'll split it into four pieces and then place it back in the stove so that there is a cross gap between those four pieces. I'll then build the fire inside of that cross gap and it will burn the center of the log up and outwards as it goes. Can it be done? Absolutely. And it will work in this stove. My question is, why would you want to? It provides a lot of the same benefits of, you know, light it once and it goes on for a long period of time. But the problem is, it, at least in my thinking, is I have to find a log that size to cut the end off and split open. Uh, considering that this is intended to be a stove used by ultralight hikers, its intent really is with small twigs that I either break off from dry branches or pick up off of the ground. Uh, that's the type of wood that this stove is intended for use. If I have the means of cutting a large, now this is five inches in diameter, so maybe a four inch diameter log, if I have the means of cutting that and then a knife uh, robust enough to baton into four pieces, uh, and I'm permitted to have an open fire, why wouldn't I just have an open fire? I'm not sure. You know, yeah, maybe I would choose to do that. It's a novelty in my mind. To me, it's just so much easier to go around and pick up small pieces of wood. Even if I'm cutting trees that are one inch in diameter that are dead and splitting those down, um, I'm still a lot less wood processing than, uh, and a lot more available wood than it would be to find just the right sized log to get in here. Okay, so... In answer to that question, I have used it with a bottom-up burn, a top-down burn, but I have not used it with a Swedish fire torch because I just don't see it as appropriate to this stove. But what we are going to do now is take it into the fire pit, we'll get it set up with charcoal, and I'll do some cooking on it. Okay, there was one more question that people had asked that uh, I almost forgot to share with you the answer. And that is people were looking for some close-ups of the stove. Apparently I didn't give a very close-up detailed look at the stove in that original video. So why don't I unassemble the stove and I'll show you how it goes together and then give you some of those close-ups. So actually this is a good opportunity to show you how you unassemble the stove.
done. All right, that's all there is to it. Now, the two pot clips or pot stand act as clips to hold. I can do this without my glasses on. To hold the stove flat when you slide it into the envelope that it comes with, the carrying package. So there you go. So there it is all flattened down. Uh, very light as I mentioned before and I'll put some of the original specifications for the stove in this video. If you want to see more about that and uh, more of an explanation, uh, I'll link the full length video uh, to the end of this video. So that's how it comes packaged and there's a nice little carrying case that comes with it that has snaps to hold it shut. It's been sufficient and I can get a few extras in there like the pot stands and the, the alcohol ring and those types of things will go in there nice. But to assemble it, it couldn't get any easier. It's just the reverse of the disassemble. So pull the two pot stands off, hold them aside and the stove literally wants to fall into shape. It's got a spring steel. Now you'll see it's not fully in shape yet. What I do is the easiest way is to drop it down like that on my knee and I can push the fire grate. Now the fire grate does need a little bit of assembling by pushing it down just to its final resting place. And the ash pan in the bottom of it also needs to be pushed down into it, lock in, there, locks in at the bottom. Okay, so all that's left to do after that is, let me show you the pot stands. These pot stands are wonderful. Not only are they lightweight, but look at the design on the end of it. I think I, well, I did show it before, but the open concept right there means that doesn't matter how much of a roaring fire you have, you just can drop that on without any difficulty and no risk of burning your fingers. All right, let's see what I can do in terms of close-up. So let's start with the outside. So these two larger holes, this one and this one, are for uh, gas attachments, both the Trangia and the uh, Primus, I believe it is, gas attachments. So th that's where you would feed the feed hoses out to the external port if that's what you wanted to use. The remaining holes all the way around are designed for airflow. And that's uh, Tobias being an engineer uh, calculated the amount of airflow needed to make this a good working stove. What I'm going to show you now is the inside and uh, hopefully I can show you this right here is an example of the uh, welded on rivets that are limiters in terms of dropping the rings down inside. Why don't I show you how one of those rings work again. So this time in fact I'll show you the Trangia ring. So this is the Trangia plate and it's hinged here. I guess I can show you that as well. There's a pin running through a hinge on the outside, not unlike some other folding stoves have, one on each side, and they form a little bump on the inside. So the plate has little notches right here, and of course right here as well. And those notches are what you line up with the hinge as you drop the plate in till it sits on the rivets. There you go. And that limits it from going any further. Then you drop your trangia in there. And with the pot stand, it's uh, a little tall. So the uh, Tobias includes some aluminum square or rectangular piping, I guess it is, that you can lay on edge. And uh, again, if you go back and watch my video, you can see uh, the good job it does in terms of uh, fast boil times. Uh, okay, so let's see if there's anything else I can show you. Close up of the fire grate inside ash pan on the bottom. I've had, I'm trying to think, maybe a dozen fires. I have a lot of stoves, as I'm sure you're well aware. So it's not like this gets used all the time, but I really enjoy it. it I mean, it's just so light and easy to use that you can tell from the discoloration that I have used it a fair amount. I do keep it clean. Now, there's a question that was posted. Should I oil my Brennelly Hobo stove after I clean it? I do. And, I, and, I, and Tobias will tell you, no, don't. Tobias will say that that will create a sticky surface for gumming up later. So he says the best thing you can do is wipe it out, wash it out if necessary, wipe it out and dry it off well before putting it away. Um, I wash my note. I use WD-40 often to clean out all of any materials that are built up in, on the inside of it. I'll wash that out with soap and water but then I will often spray it with WD-40 and wipe off any excess after the fact to give it a coating. I have not had any gunk buildup on it. In fact, I like to think that it kind of gives it a bit of a seasoning. Yes, I know it's stainless steel, spring steel, so how do you season it like that? But there's no rusting. That's what I can say about it. It's probably as much due to the quality of the stainless steel as it is to my maintenance routine. But Tobias says, no, don't oil them as part of your maintenance program. My suggestion is, 
It's up to you, but I oil them. That's, that's just me, and it hasn't been an issue for me yet. All right, I think that's everything I can show you in terms of close-ups and I'll answer all the other questions that were put to me. Now let's get this set up with some charcoal. All right, so I have the Brennelly set up in my fire pit here. It provides good uh, wind protection for many loose sparks that may travel as well as retain the heat in this area. Uh, and of course, it's a fire safe surface. The Brennelly does have the ash pan built in, which is wonderful, but it's nice to have that extra security of having uh, a nice saw uh, fire safe surface underneath it. Using the wood wool, just get this lit and dropped in. Give it a second, all right, there we go. Give that a second or two to kind of catch on. I think I'm gonna need a little stick for prodding the fire around with. And I'm putting it into the center. Okay, that was good. And I can start adding in some charcoal. So not a whole lot to see here. It takes some time for uh, the charcoal to really engage. And uh, as I mentioned, I'll be cooking my lunch over this. And that lunch, by the way, will be appearing in a separate video, which I will likely link at the end of this one. So, yeah. That's what I'll do, is I'll continue to work on this to get the charcoal all up to heat, and I'll bring you back when I start cooking up my lunch. And I'll let this rest for a second. I think I'll take it off now, because I still have to prepare my avocado to go with it. Boy, this is a big meal. Yeah, I won't be eating all this, I don't think, anyway. Okay, that's ready. So I'm taking that off of the heat. I'm setting it aside. I'm going to work on the avocado, and I'll bring it back when it's time to... I'm going to set that there. When it's time to assemble our dinner. Okay, folks, this was just a, a quick demonstration and an update of using the Brennelly Hobo Stove with charcoal. And you can see how well it worked for frying up my lunch there. Uh, yeah, but I'm gonna, I'll share with you what my lunch was, but watch for a separate video if it hasn't come out before this one. So basically, I made some ketogenic flatbreads with a, an egg when ham and peppers and onions and mushrooms all fried up in it, and then some avocado and some um, sriracha mayo on top of it, and that's what I made up using the hobo with charcoal. <laughs> A special meal, indeed. But again, I just wanted to share with you that you can use the Brennelly hobo stove with charcoal very effectively. Um, I will do some more cooking. Well, obviously, I'll take it out. I enjoy using this stove. I will do some more cooking with it, with the top lid and the, and the bottom lid burned, because that's what people had asked for. There's very little likelihood that I will do a full Swedish fire torch with a single big log split into four. I may. Uh, I just, again, I'm sorry for those people who like doing that. I don't see the point, to be quite honest. If you can convince me, then I'll do that. But if you have any other questions about the Brennelly, any comments, uh, if you have any experiences with it, then by all means share it. Uh, you, you wouldn't think with the thin stainless steel, even with the quality of it, that it would last this long, but it has. It lasts this long. It should last for a lot longer. In fact, you know, now a dozen or so fires in it, and you saw how hot that got. That got smoking red hot. And, uh, right, I can't. It's too hot to handle. That's the reason I've, I'm not showing it to you. But um, if there's any issues with it after this, I'll be sure to report those. Okay, folks, I'm going to enjoy my meal while I can. And uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, put them in the comment section below. But until we see you again, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.